Welcome to Orbital Dynamics, Part 41. This part is based heavily on the book Feynman's Lost Lecture, and is also based on excerpts from the book The Mechanical Universe. Some of what I'll say in this part is taken from both these books verbatim. The universal law of gravitation did not yield even to the great Newton at his first effort. He battled with it and struggled with the behavior of gravity. In what way must gravity depend on distance to account for Kepler's third law, which relates the period and radius of a planet's orbit? Or a second law, which relates the speed of an orbit to the distance from the central body? After his discoveries, Newton kept them secret for 20 years. In 1684, at the request of his friend Edmund Halley, he stated that a force which decreases inversely as the square of the distance leads to orbits which are ellipses, circles, and the other conic sections, parabolas and hyperbolas, which we'll discuss later. Newton wrote a nine-page paper on the motion of bodies in orbit, where he described his discoveries and his law of universal gravitation. Halley recognized that this was an immense discovery. When Edmund Halley traveled to Cambridge to speak to Newton, to Newton in 1684, there were ideas in scientific circles that the motion of the planets might be a consequence of a force from the sun that diminished as the inverse square of the distance between the sun and the planets, but no one had yet been able to produce a satisfactory demonstration. Newton had been able to demonstrate that such a force would give rise to elliptical orbits, exactly what Kepler had deduced 70 years earlier from Tycho's observations. Halley urged Newton to let him see the demonstration. Newton apparently begged off, saying he had misplaced it, but promised to work it out again. A few months later, in November 1684, Newton sent Halley the nine-page paper, where he demonstrated that an inverse square law of gravity, together with some basic principles of dynamics, would account not only for elliptical orbits, but Kepler's other laws of planetary motion and more. Halley knew that he held in his hands the key to understanding the universe as it was then conceived. Newton, not entirely satisfied, delayed publication, wanting to make revisions. That lasted almost three years, during which Newton, now hooked on the problem, seems to have done nothing else but work on it. What emerged at the end, in 1687, was Principia Mathematica, Newton's masterpiece and the book that created modern science. Nearly 300 years later, the physicist Richard Feynman, apparently for his own amusement, undertook to prove Kepler's laws of ellipses himself, using no mathematics more advanced than elementary plane geometry. He was asked to give a guest lecture to the Caltech freshman class in March 1964. The lecture was recorded, and photographs were taken, but they were lost. The recorded lecture was incomprehensible without the photographs. Feynman's notes for that lecture were later rediscovered among papers of his close colleague Robert Lighton after Lighton's death. David L. Goodstein and Judith R. Goodstein, with the rediscovered notes and the audio, wrote a book titled Feynman's Lost Lecture where they recreated the lecture and even added in some details Feynman glossed over. In this diagram, S represents the sun. Consider it our immovable central force. A is the first position of our planet. Let's put B here. The line segment between A and B denotes the distance traveled over a given, given time interval we'll call delta T. The motion from A to B is linear. Because there's no force acting on the planet, it travels, according to Newton's first law, in a straight line. If the planet continues in its motion, unperturbed by any force, it will continue in a straight line. At time delta t, starting at b, it will reach little c. The length of segment ab equals the length of segment b little c. We're going to show geometrically that if we construct the triangle sb little c, it will equal triangle sab. Feynman proved this by considering segments ab and b little c the bases of each triangle. If we extend the line along the bases and then drop a perpendicular line from the apex S, we see that both triangles have the same height. We said that the bases were equal because the delta T's were the same, and the planet was moving at a constant velocity. Newton proved this another way. He dropped a perpendicular line up from A to SB and down from little c to SB. Here the base SB is common to both triangles. These are complementary angles, so they're equal. These angles are formed by parallel lines that intersect the same line, so these angles are the same. The remaining angles are 90 degrees, so they're the same. All three angles of each triangle are the same. We said already that the length of AB equals B little c. If two sides of two triangles are equal, and if all the angles are equal, then the triangles are identical, 
This means that the heights represented by the dotted segment from A to SB and little c to SB are the same. The area of, of triangle SAB equals the area of SB little c. We prove this both with Feynman's method and Newton's. Since the triangles have equal areas, we just proved that from the perspective of a point in space, S, a planet moving in a straight line at a constant velocity sweeps out an equal area in equal time. This sounds a lot like Kepler's second law. If the planet traveled to a point D in the same time delta T time interval, the area SCD would equal the area of SBC and SAB. Newton postulated that the sun exerts a force on planets. Let's show what a force would do. The sun exerts a continuous force. We're going to postulate this first with an instantaneous or impulsive force. Let's have the force occur at point B at the end of the first delta T interval. If we add the force to the position vector B little c, it results in the point big C. This sets up a parallelogram. And we can now draw a line segment from S to big C. C is the new position that the planet will arrive at given the force applied at point B. It travels from B to C in our time interval delta T. This sets up another triangle. Triangles SB little c and SB big C have the same bases, SB. The heights of both triangles are shown here. The line segment big C little c is parallel to the base SB. So if we draw perpendicular lines from little c to SB and big C to SB, both heights are equal. Since they share a common base and since they both have the same height, the area of SB big C is equal to SB little c, and we already show that SB little c's area is equal to SAB. The diagram in this animation is adapted from Feynman's diagram, which was adapted from Newton's original. Here we'll show a succession of forces. If no additional force were acting on the planet, it would go from B to little c, and then to little d. Like before, we'll apply a force at B. That will divert the path to big C. That results in this area swept out. Let's compute it so we can keep track of the areas of each of these triangles. At big C, let's apply an identical force. That will divert the path to big D. That results in this area swept out. And here's that area computed. Then we'll apply an identical force at D. That will divert the path to big E. Here's that area swept out. And here it is computed. Here we're changing the forces or delta Vs for all the points. Notice that the area swept out remain constant. As long as the force is along the path from the point to the sun, the area swept out remains the same. Here, each of the forces is different. If we change any single one, the areas still remain the same. This is a somewhat general form of Kepler's law, second law. Any force directed at a planet from the sun, the central body, will result in the planet sweeping out equal areas in equal time. I've shown you an impulse force model where the forces are imparted at separate instances in time. We can shorten the time periods. If the delta t's were made smaller, this eventually converges on a continuous force which would result in a smooth path. What you're seeing here is called the conservation of angular momentum. Have you ever taken a weight on a string and twirled it around and then let the string wrap around your finger? As the string gets shorter, it twirls faster. If you then let the string out, it twirls slower. If you let the string out really far, it twirls really slow. The area swept out always remains the same. Hence, if the string is shorter, the weight must travel faster. If the string is longer, the weight must travel slower. In section 16, we talked about Kepler's second law and cross products. A cross B is the magnitude of A times the magnitude of B times the sine of the angle between them along the normal unit vector N. The magnitude of the cross product is the area of the parallelogram formed by the two vectors. In this case, it would be the cross product of the force vector and the resulting velocity vector. That's the area defined by the parallelogram formed by S, D, E, and S prime.
is twice the area of the triangle. Saying the cross products of all the velocity and force vectors are equal is synonymous with saying that all the triangular areas are equal. We've derived Kepler's second law, equal area swept out in equal time, by using, by using Newton's first two laws. A body in motion will remain in motion unless acted upon by a force, and a change in motion is proportional to a force applied and is in the direction of the applied force. Feynman and Newton next used Kepler's third law to show that the gravitational force caused by the sun is proportional to 1 over r squared. In the previous section, we derived Kepler's third law from Newton's law of gravitation, which is based on a 1 over r squared relationship. This is the same derivation the other way around. Kepler's third law states that the period of an orbit squared is proportional to the semi-major axis cubed. The argument Newton described in his paper to Edmund Halley doesn't seem to work for Feynman, and Feynman's lecture was cryptic. The authors David and Judith Goodstein devised their own. Let's assume a circular orbit. We'll deal with ellipses later. With the diagrams we used to derive Kepler's second law, we can consider the segments AB, BC, and CD, and so on to be velocity vectors. They are the distance traveled over time delta t. The velocity vectors on the position diagram are connected. We can also draw them collected. Vector VAB on the position diagram is parallel to the velocity vector VAB on the velocity diagram. Vector VBC on the position diagram is parallel to VBC on the velocity diagram. Likewise, vector VCD on the position diagram is parallel to VCD on the velocity diagram. The length of the velocity vectors are proportional to the speed. The faster the planet is moving, the longer the velocity vector. The velocity vectors in the position diagram are shorter than their corresponding vectors on the velocity diagram. I made the velocity diagram bigger for clarity. It's the relative sizes that matter, not the actual sizes. The first change in velocity, which we refer to as, as acceleration, is parallel to the position vector SB. On the position diagram, this delta V vector is superimposed on the position vector SB. On the velocity diagram, the delta V vector is parallel to SB. Delta V is always in the direction of the planet to the sun. The first one is at the point B where the impulse occurs. VAB is the velocity vector before the force is applied. VBC is the velocity vector after the force is applied. The change in velocity, delta VBC, is vector VAB minus VBC. Delta VBC is proportional to the magnitude of the force. Here's the next delta V, or force vector, delta VCD. Consider Newton's second law, F equals MA. If the force were twice as big, delta V would be twice as big. If the force were half as big, delta V would be half as big. As I said, the force is proportional to the delta velocity or acceleration. That's what F equals MA implies. If you were to make the intervals half as long, there'd be twice as many intervals, and each change in velocity would have to be half as big in order for the motion to stay circular. The net force would be the same, however. Force is proportional to the change in velocity over the change in time. That's delta V over delta T. In this case, the orbit is a circle with a semi-major axis, or radius, R. This is what a, Newton what a Newtonian diagram for a circular orbit looks like. Each of the distances, S, A, S, B, S, C, and so on, equals R, the radius. Each change in velocity, each delta V, is also equal. The radius of the velocity diagram is V. This implies that all the speeds along A, B, B, C, and B, D, or so on, and so on, are equal. This is constant circular motion, or at least segmented constant circular motion. The Newtonian diagram forms a regular polygon, a figure with equal sides and angles inscribed in a circle. In the velocity diagram, the velocities are all of equal length and equal angles. This implies that all the delta Vs, or the changes in velocities, are equal. Thus, the velocity diagram is also a regular polygon. The fact that both are regular polygons implies that if the intervals are made smaller and smaller, they both converge on circles. Hence, this is a good way to approximate the actual motion. If we consider one full revolution, the planet travels the circumference of the position diagram, 2 pi r. The time it takes to do this is the period t of the orbit. Therefore, the uniform velocity is 2 pi r over t. In the velocity diagram, the velocity vector rotates once. 
if we construct two ten two if we construct two position vectors connected by a line, as the interval gets smaller and smaller, the line eventually converges on a line that's tangent to the circle. Velocity is tangent to the path of the orbit. For a circular orbit, the velocity is orthogonal or at right angles to the, to the position vector. If the position vector rotates through two pi radians, then the velocity vector has to do the same. The tip of the velocity vector rotates through a circumference of 2 pi v, since the radius of the circle that encompasses the velocity vectors is v. Since the change in velocity delta v is constant through the orbit, delta v over delta t for any delta t is the circumference 2 pi v over the period t. Let's express that as 2 pi over t times v. Since we're interested in the force, and since we know that force is proportional to delta v over delta t, we can say that the force is proportional to 2 pi over t times v. We said that v equals 2 pi r t. We can make that substitution for v. The force is now proportional to 2 pi over t times 2 pi r over t. The right-hand side of that equals 4 pi squared times r over t squared. Since this is a proportionality equation, we can drop the 4 pi squared term. It's a constant. The change in velocity delta v is proportional to the radius r over the period squared. Now we employ Kepler's third law that says that t squared is proportional to r cubed. If we substitute r cubed for t squared in our proportionality equation for force, that results in f being proportional to r over r cubed. That simplifies to the force being proportional to 1 over r squared. That's the connection we've been looking for. Now that we've derived Kepler's second law and used his third law to determine that the sun's gravitational force is proportional to 1 over r squared, from here we can derive Kepler's first law, which states that the orbit of the planets are in the shape of an ellipse. Let's apply the 1 over squared principle to the Newtonian diagram we've been working with. Here we show an object that starts at a and travels at some velocity over a time delta t to b. The central body is the point s. We'll apply a force along SB that will divert the object's path to C. We'll do the same to divert the path to D. And E and F and G and H and I. Notice that the red force ve vectors diminish from point B to point I. I'm sorry, to point H. That's because the object gets farther away from the central body S. As it moves farther away, the force diminishes by 1 over r squared. I've shown you the calculations to do this before. Feynman and Newton did their derivations geometrically, so I'm going to stick to geometry in this case. If I move point B, I'm essentially increasing delta t for all the intervals, or I'm increasing, increasing and decreasing it. If I increase it, the object travels farther in each interval. Notice that the shape um, from points the notice the shape that points A through I trace. They follow the path of an ellipse. If I bring very close if I bring B very close to A, the points follow the ellipse more closely. In Newton's calculus, when he reduced delta t to an infinitesimally small period, the points became a smooth ellipse. If I change the shape of the ellipse, the points still trace out in ellipse. And if I change the shape to a circle, then the points trace through a circle. In this case, all the forces are the same, and we showed that on the previous slide. So if we move this back to an ellipse, this demonstrates geometrically that a force from a central body that diminishes at 1 over r squared traces out an ellipse. While it confirms Kepler's first law, it doesn't prove it. Feynman set out to prove Kepler's first law geometrically using simple planar geometry. For that, he had to employ a method that diverged from Newton's. In Newton's paper to Halley, he divided an orbit into segments of equal time. Delta t was the same in all cases.
Feynman took a different approach. He couldn't work out Newton's proof, so he used a proof that appeared in a little book called Matter in Motion, written by James Clerk Maxwell, published in 1877. Maxwell attributes, attributes this method of proof to Sir William Hamilton. Equal areas and equal time would look like this. The planet orbiting the sun moves faster at periapsis, or more correctly perihelion, when it's closest to the sun, and slower at aphelion when it's farther away. Hamilton and then Feynman divide the orbit into equal central angles, not equal areas. In this diagram, the two central angles are equal. Let's represent these on a Newton-type diagram in which the planet undergoes initial straight-line motions punctuated by velocity changes due to the force of gravity. The velocity changes, or the delta v's, would go here. I've exaggerated the lengths for clarity, and notice the two delta v's are not the same. At perihelion, the planet travels from A to B, gets diverted by delta v due to the sun, and then continues from B to C. At aphelion, the planet goes from D to E, gets diverted by delta V due to the sun again, and then continues from E to F. The planet moves faster from A to B to C than at aphelion from D to E to F. Kepler's second law says that the planet sweeps out equal areas in equal time. Because we're using equal central angles, the area swept out at aphelion is greater than the area swept out at perihelion. That means it takes less time for the planet to travel from A to B to C than D to E to F. We can determine how much faster the planet travels by comparing the areas of the triangles SBC and SEF since the times are proportional to the areas swept out. SBC and SEF are similar triangles. That means that if the base of the larger triangle is twice as big as the smaller, then the altitude is also twice as big. The area of the larger one, being one-half base times height, would be two squared times as big. The general rule is that the area is proportional to the square of the distance from the sun. The time it takes to go through any portion of the orbit is proportional to the area swept out, which is proportional to the square of the distance from the sun. Delta T is proportional Delta T is proportional to R squared, where R is the distance from the planet to the sun. We also know that force is proportional to 1 over R squared. We already said that force is proportional to delta V over delta T. That's the same as saying that force is proportional to acceleration. That, in turn, is the same as saying that force times delta T is proportional to delta V. Since force is proportional to 1 over R squared, we can say the delta V is proportional to 1 over R squared times R squared, and that equals 1. That means that delta V is constant when the central angles are equal. In this diagram, I've shown delta Vs that are not equal. That's correct for an impulse force that's supplied at discrete intervals. Here we're talking about a constant force that's supplied over the entire interval. When the planet gets farther away from the sun, like at aphelion, the force acting on it gets weaker as the square of the distance, but the time the force has to act on the planet gets longer, also as the square of the distance. The same effect occurs at perihelion, when the planet is closer. The force gets stronger as the square of the distance, but the time gets shorter as the square of the distance. Equal changes in velocity occur when the orbit moves through equal angles. The delta v's all the way around the orbit are the same. In his lecture, Feynman reached this conclusion with this example. David and Judith Goodstein, who wrote the book Feynman's Lost Lecture, added a more rigorous proof. Consider two arbitrary orbit segments, each with the same central angle. Lay the triangle SWX on top of SGH like this. It's always possible to draw a line through WX that's parallel to HG, such that the two gray triangles have equal areas. The triangle S little g little h has the same area as S big W big X. It's bigger by one of the great triangles and an equal amount smaller by the other. S little g little h is small, similar to S big G big H. Now draw a line from S to the point where Wx crosses little h little g.
and that's this line here. S big Z and S little z are the distances from the sun to the orbit. According to the property of similar triangles, the base and altitude of each increase as the size, so the areas are proportional to the square of the size. The similar triangle S big G big H and S little g little h have areas in proportion to the squares of the length S big Z and S little z here. S w X has the same area as S little g little h, so the area of SWX is also in proportion to the square of S little z. That's here. If we shrink the central angle down smaller and smaller, the line S big Z little z always stays inside the angle. And because the points W and X on the elliptical orbit get closer and closer together, the length S little z ultimately becomes equal to SW or SX, which means which is what we previously called the distance to the sun. If I construct a Newtonian diagram through an entire ellipse, it would look like this. And notice again the delta v's are different. Because delta, delta v is proportional to 1 over r squared, but also this length here, each of these lengths here are proportional to 1 over r squared. So to compute the actual delta v over the entire range, say over this range here, I would take this delta v and divide it by this distance, which is proportional to 1 over r squared. That would normalize to delta v's, and that's how I get equal delta v's in all cases. Let's set this up now as a position diagram and a corresponding velocity diagram. The first position will be here. You can see the small velocity vector on the right. That corresponds to this velocity here. I've scaled the velocity vector up, otherwise it would be really small. Remember too that we made this the average, average velocity by dividing it by 1 over r squared. You can see that the small velocity line on the position diagram is parallel to the velocity vector on the velocity diagram. This next segment depicts the planet moving. That corresponds to this normalized and magnified velocity vector. This segment between the two velocity vectors is the delta v. It's the difference between the two velocity vectors, hence it's called delta v. The delta v vector is parallel to the first position vector. What that means is that the delta v, or the force, goes from the planet's position towards the sun at point s. Here's a new position. Here's a representation of the velocity normalized and magnified. Here's the delta v between those two velocities. Here's another position. Here's the velocity normalized and magnified. And here's that delta v. The velocity vectors on the position diagram don't correspond in length to the velocity vectors on the velocity diagram. The velocity diagram is not only larger, remember that they're normalized by 1 over r squared. The delta v's on the velocity diagram, however, are all the same. That will become more evident as we proceed. Let's build out the rest of the position vectors, velocity vectors and delta velocity vectors. The position diagram now very closely approximates an ellipse. The velocity diagram now very closely approximates a circle. With the velocity di diagram, if all the delta velocity vectors are equal, we end up with a regular polygon. That means that the angles between each delta velocity are also equal. If we add more vectors, decreasing the central angle on the position diagram, the velocity diagram would converge to a circle. Let's change the position of the central point S. This is the case we looked at earlier, uniform circular motion. The velocity diagram is still a circle, however. Its center point is moved to the center of the velocity diagram circle. No matter what the shape of the ellipse, the velocity diagram stays circular. All that changes is the location of the central point of the velocity diagram. Here we abandon the impulse model and deal with smooth curves. Here's the first position diagram. The instantaneous velocity is tangent to the path of the planet
and goes along in this direction. After some later time, the planet arrives at point P at an angle theta from the initial position. The origin of the velocity diagram would be off-center. The normalized and magnified velocity vector depicts the planet's speed at point J. The longer the line, the faster the speed. Notice that point J on the position diagram is closest to the Sun, where the orbital speed is greatest. Therefore, the corresponding line on the velocity diagram must pass through the center of the circle because it has to be the longest line on the velocity diagram. Here's the instantaneous velocity for the point P. That corresponds to this normalized and magnified velocity vector on the velocity diagram. If we draw this segment from the center of the velocity diagram to the point little p, we find that the angle from p to j is also theta. We drew position vectors with equal central angles. That resulted in a velocity diagram with equal delta v's. If we then draw segments between the delta v's and the center point of the cir circle, we get equal angles as well. Because we're dividing up both shapes into an equal number of segments, the angle on the position diagram has to be the same angle theta on the velocity diagram. Now that we've established how the two diagrams correspond, we can construct an orbit. We'll start from the velocity diagram. It's an easier starting point since it's just a circle. Start with a point within the circle. I pick one that's off-center. The shape of the orbit will depend on where we place this point. If we put the point at the center of the circle, we'll end up with a circular path for the orbit. That's uniform circular motion. Also, we could have placed the point anywhere on anywhere within the circle. By putting it directly below the center, we'll end up with an orbital path that's aligned horizontally. A line chosen from the point to the perimeter of the circle characterizes the velocity. This segment being the longest characterizes the greatest velocity in the orbital path. According to Kepler's second law, equal areas and equal time, this point will be the closest to the central body. Here's the velocity component superimposed on the position J. Now we draw a point from the origin to any other point on the circle. That corresponds to a point P on the position diagram. The velocity vector at P is tangent to the path and is parallel to the velocity vector on the velocity diagram. If we draw this segment, then these two angles are equal. At each angle theta, we know the direction of the tangent of the orbital path we're trying to construct. Now we need a method to construct the curve. This vex Feynman at first. The trick is to rotate the velocity diagram by 90 degrees. Now the central angle is the same on both diagrams. The two velocity lines, v and p, and v and little p, are now perpendicular. We can fix that by drawing a line that's perpendicular to the line marked vp on the velocity diagram. The easiest way to draw the path of the orbit is right within the velocity diagram. We don't care about size or scale. It's the shape we're concerned about. This is Kepler's first law that deals only with the shape of the orbit. At this point, the perpendicular bisector crosses the line connecting P to the center of the circle. As P moves around the circle, it traces out an ellipse. If we draw this segment here, you can see that these two line segments are equal. This is an isosceles triangle, and those two sides are equal sides. Here we have a more general version of this. Notice these two line segments here. And notice how they change as we rotate this point around the circle. This is our definition of an ellipse, where this side plus this side equals the major axis. And you'll notice this side plus this, this side is equal to this side plus this side. And so what we've done is we found another way to construct an ellipse. If I change the eccentricity, you'll notice that these two red sides are still equal, and I still trace out an ellipse. If I collapse the focal points down into a circle, now I'm simply tracing out a smaller circle within a circle. Now notice what happens when I move one of the focal points outside the circle. This is something Newton discovered that Kepler hadn't predicted with his laws.
This is hyperbola, and it's a valid orbital path. It's one of the conic sections that an orbiting planet or orbiting body can follow. So with this geometrical derivation, we've proven that planets can follow in the in paths more than just an ellipse. And if I were able to get this point on the circle exactly, I'd have a parabola. So the three valid orbital paths for an orbiting body are an ellipse, in this case, a hyperbola, in this case, and here the object is on P following the hyperbola. And where this point is right on the circle, a parabola. With the help of this geometric construction, we've shown that an orbit has the shape of, of an ellipse. That's the third of Kepler's three laws. We've also shown it can have the shape of a parabola or a, hyper, or a hyperbola. Newton's dynamical laws, together with one over our, a 1 over r squared force, always produces a circular velocity diagram. The shape of the orbit depends on where O, the origin of the velocity diagram, is. If O coincides with C, the center of the diagram, then the two foci of the ellipse coincide, and the planet has the same speed in all parts of its orbit. It's a circular orbit. If the origin is anywhere between C and the circumference of the diagram, the orbit is an ellipse. The closer the origin is to C, the more circular, the farther, and the more towards the perimeter, the more eccentric the orbit. If the origin is right on the perimeter, the orbit's a parabola, and if the origin is outside the circle, then the path is a, hyper is a hyperbola. The planet doesn't actually orbit in those last two cases. Those are escape trajectories that we'll get into later.